You know, I'm uh, genuinely a bit scared when it comes to this thing because, see, anytime we feature a Toyota four-wheel drive, I get these like jabs of fear because Toyota four-wheel drive owners, especially Land Cruiser owners, they can be, uh, let's say, extremely opinionated and very biased. See, if you dare criticize their precious Toyota four-wheel drive, well, they, they can get a bit emotional and have something of a tantrum. And apparently the person criticizing it, well, at best, they're a complete moron, or at worst, the Antichrist resurrected. But the thing is, it is our job here at Redriven to thoroughly take you through the good and the bad points of the vehicles we cover. So how about we just ignore my personal safety and well-being for a moment and open up the can of worms that is the 100 series Toyota Land Cruiser. Now look, unless you've just woken up from like a 25 year long coma, you already know that the iconic 100 series Toyota Land Cruiser is arguably one of the most reliable, capable, and just durable four-wheel drives ever built. But the thing is, they're not as perfect as many owners will lead you to believe. So we're gonna take you through what goes wrong with these, what they're like to live with on a daily basis, and if you should buy one at all. But just in case you're not one of the Land Cruiser faithful, how about a quick history lesson on the 100 series? First of all, there are technically two iterations of this generation of Land Cruiser, the 100 and the 105. Under the sheet metal, the 105 is extremely similar to the previous 80 series Land Cruiser, carrying over the majority of its chassis and running gear with solid axles and coil springs, both front and rear. And thanks to this, 105s are generally far better suited to serious off-road use. But the 100 series, on the other hand, which may look very much the same, but it's actually quite a different beast altogether. It has a wider chassis, independent front suspension, rack and pinion power assisted steering, all for better on-road manners, and from launch in 1998 featured a 4.7 litre petrol V8 joined by a turbo diesel inline six. Then in 2002, Toyota revised the lineup. The 105 dropped an engine, transmissions changed on a few trim specs, and the Land Cruiser saw all the standard updates to equipment and safety features that you'd expect. Now, as far as trim specs go, here in Australia, the 105 was initially available across three levels, with the 100 available in just two. But post that 2002 update, not only did that arrangement swap, Toyota changed what a couple were even called. There were also like a host of other special editions as well and other minor updates. And depending on where you're watching this from, these are ostensibly the same vehicle as the Lexus LX470, the Toyota Cygnus and the Land Cruiser Amazon. Now look, we're gonna get into what these cost to buy later on, but heads up, it's generally tens of thousands of dollars. So paying for it, you might be better off getting finance on it. And if you're gonna do that, do it via driver. Click that driver link down there and do the entire finance process easily online. There are no hidden fees. You can choose which finance package best suits you and you can get pre-approval in just minutes. And if you do it via that link, you're gonna get $150 worth of free fuel. And with these, that's gonna be bloody handy. Now guys, when it comes to long distance touring or off-roading, seeing where you're going is absolutely critical. And that's why we've also partnered with WiperTech. Not only are they super easy to order online, they're delivered to your door, they're easy to fit, they work perfectly. They're, honestly, they're some of the best wiper blades we've ever used in any condition. And if you do all this via that link, you're gonna get 15% off and free express shipping. Okay, now back to the Land Cruiser and let's talk looks and exterior for a minute here. Some people out there will go, oh, I don't care what it looks like as long as it's tough and reliable, does the job, that's all I care about. I call bullshit on that because the aesthetics of a vehicle are a critical part of the purchasing decision when it comes to any vehicle. You're just lucky that these things are just fundamentally attractive. But like personally, I love the way these look. I love that they're not like overly styled, it's not too flashy. Also, I think it's because it's kind of, it nails the perfect middle child balance of aesthetics. Like it's somewhere between the 60 series and the 300 series and looks, I think it just works. It looks great. But I have a bit of a question for you guys. Do you prefer like 100 series that are just drenched in accessories or ones that are left pretty much completely standard? Let us know in the comments. Okay, now the very important TBTL factor, which is the turn back to look factor. It's when you lock a car, walk away from it and turn back to look. Okay, I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna get like an 8.1, 8.125. I like it, I think it's good. I personally, I like them when they're like kind of left either completely stock or it is just covered in like a full parts catalog worth of stuff. I know they're both extremes, but I like them both. 
Now look, inside, it's going to vary a little bit on the year model and the trim spec. For example, on like the base 105s, you can actually fit six in here. There's like three across the front. Although how comfortable that middle passenger would be is, yeah, that's going to be interesting. Also, that spec comes generally with vinyl flooring and every hard plastic known to me. And so, yeah, it's tough, but not luxurious at all. But then on the flip side, something like this, like a, a late model Sahara, full leather interior, some soft touch surfaces here and there, and also this like 1970s adult film movie inspired wood grain trim. Look, overall the, the design itself doesn't change very much, it's all very much dominated by this large sort of center fascia here, but the overall ambience is gonna, it's gonna vary a little bit. Also look, I know we all love our aftermarket accessories, but can we at least attempt some cable management? Some of the photos of these we saw had like it looked like the back end of like a complex home theater system, like cables and shit all over the place. How does that not infuriate you? Also, like try to integrate like the actual things in good places rather than just like sticking them on randomly. Again, it's just so frustrating. Actually, just on all these accessories, if you're looking at one of these and the one you're looking at you're interested in because it has heaps of, you know, aftermarket accessories, make sure all of those accessories and features actually work. You'd be amazed how many people buy these because of the accessories and then find out that half the things don't even work. Now look, as far as comfort in this particular model goes, super comfy. These seats are like lounge chairs. It's such a lovely place to be. Even driving position-wise, there's an okay amount of adjustability, but I've found for my height, yeah, it's fantastic. Also, wear and tear in this one, like obviously they're all going to vary depending on which model you're looking at. This has done well over 260,000 Ks. It's had a hell of a life. Wear and tear, pretty good. Like, okay, the leather's wearing here on the armrest a bit. Some of the bolsters are pretty squidgy and the leather's, you know, has seen better days. Like obviously the, uh, the steering wheel, it's lost all of its texture up here. Even the gear selector, it's lost its texture. But considering what this thing has been put through, it's pretty good. Some of the plastics down here, they're all kind of wearing off and getting a bit scratched and looking a bit worse for wear. But in saying that, a lot of this stuff can be restored. This is easily repainted. Like this, you can probably, I don't know if you could rejuvenate this, but it's easy to get it retrimmed. It's, it's this, is, this is this owner's workhorse vehicle. And I think for the age and the kilometers, bloody good. Now, as far as practicality goes, okay size door bins there. You've got a spot for your sunglasses just up here. There's a cigarette lighter and ashtray. Yeah, whatever, disgusting. Um, spot, funnily enough, like for your phone, kind of perfectly there, sort of, kind of. Two cup holders, but there's an issue with the cup holders. Because I'm a wanker, I really like small pretentious coffees like a double ristretto or a macchiato, stuff like that. These are far too big for pretentious little coffees. You've got to have something large in there, like a real man coffee. That's not me. Under here, this is super impressive. There's so many little storage cubby holes, but then this section lifts up and you've got a little refrigerated cool box, a little esky there, more storage for cables and whatnot there. This alone, fantastic. Oh, also, okay size glove box. That's it for practicality up the front. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly five centimeters taller than another tough and reliable legend, Australia's most respected outback adventurer, Russell Coit. This is in my driving position. It is so comfortable. The seats themselves, so, so comfy. Like it is lounge chair comfortable. Good amount of knee room. Feet room is okay. I've got pretty big feet, but so, you know, they they're a struggle to fit anywhere. But ambience up here, lovely. Big glass house, so it just feels, yeah, it's a really nice place to be. Wear and tear, again, this thing gets a workout, but really good, like the leather's still super plush, good amounts of texture on it, door cards are in good nick, a few little scratches on the plastic here and the backs of the seats, but nothing too bad. Good for wear and tear. Look, obviously, again, wear and tear, it's gonna vary depending on which one you're looking at, but this one, good. Then practicality in the back seat, you've got some nets in case you go fishing, need to put the, the fish somewhere. You've got three cup holders in the back, which is pretty cool. It's kind of a little pop-down door system there. You do have door bins, but they're near impossible to get to if you're sitting in the seat. Also, vents in the ceiling, ashtrays, gross. And a pull-down armrest. Now, room in the back, stacks guys, loads of space back here. Plus it's a split tailgate, which is awesome. Super handy just to lift that up and throw the groceries in the back or pop this down and sit and have a picnic. Also on some of the 105s, they open like a barn door. We'll throw a photo of that up. But yeah, room in the back, stacks.
Now, as far as the tech and features go, look, from the factory, you can forget any kind of really modern phone connectivity. They just simply didn't have that. Even in a lot of these in the used market, they've had their infotainment systems upgraded, but even by now, some of those are getting pretty long in the tooth. But you can do what this owner has done, which is fit like a current aftermarket infotainment system. That way you can get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. You can also fit like reversing cameras, parking sensors, all that sort of stuff. It can be done pretty easily. But please, please, please use quality items. If you get cheap stuff from eBay or Alibaba, we've read some horror stories about wiring issues and just them being crap. So get a good one. Now also besides the infotainment stuff, if you're looking at one of the base model 105s or a standard 105, just make sure that it has air conditioning. Air conditioning was an option on those. Most of them here in Australia will have aircon, but you don't want to have one that doesn't have aircon in Australia because it gets pretty hot. Now, besides all of that, get ready to hit the pause button to see what the early base spec models have. You ready? And go. And if you want to see what the later and higher spec models have, get ready to hit pause now. But look, when it comes to using all of this equipment now, like years and years and years later and hundreds of thousands of kilometers later, really good like all the buttons still feel great indicator and you know wiper stalks feel good it just everything in here feels tough plus on top of all of that you have the four-wheel drive equipment like a two-speed transfer case center diff and limited slip rear diff but all the other variants have permanent four-wheel drive plus from late 2005 toyota introduced their electronically modulated suspension or their thames systems that controlled the damping of the shocks and an active height control system that obviously adjusts the height of the vehicle, but can also self-level. Now, look, as far as safety goes, this is about the same size as an, an average Sydney apartment, and it was designed to handle the toughest conditions possible. So from a sheer physics standpoint, you'd think it's pretty safe, but it is lacking here and there. But to take you through exactly what safety features you can expect, it seems only appropriate that we do this next section kind of like an early 2000s Land Cruiser TV ad. The toughest of the tough, designed, engineered and built to handle whatever you can throw at it while keeping everybody on board safe. It's the 100 and 105 series Land Cruiser. Just ignore the early base spec examples because they don't even have airbags. But higher spec variants did pack a couple of airbags, ABS and even load limiting front seat belts. Then from late 1999, the GXV and eventually the VX and Sahara were further equipped with electronic stability control, traction control, electronic brake force distribution and brake assist. Now look guys, obviously there is so much more to the Land Cruiser than just this. And if you do need all the real specific details, go to redriven.com and check out the awesome and completely free Redriven cheat sheet. It's gonna answer all of your deep dark questions when it comes to these things. So look, if you search 100 or 105 series Land Cruiser on YouTube, you're gonna be presented with like endless hours of videos of these things tackling insane terrain in some godforsaken part of the planet. So because of that, there's no point in me repeating all of that all over again, because like honestly, what hasn't been said about these things' sheer abilities? But you know what hasn't been discussed very much, especially on video? What these things are like to drive in the real world, like here in Sydney. See, look, as heartbreaking as this is, the majority of these spend most of their time not like beating the wilderness into submission, but doing stuff like parking and getting groceries and picking the kids up from school, like normal day-to-day -day activities. So therefore, like, what's it like to drive here in its natural environment? First of all, look, it does feel big. It obviously is a big vehicle, but it actually hides its size relatively well. Now, look, I know the Ram 1500 is a very different beast to this, and we reviewed one of those, but this hides its size and weight way better than that thing does. It just felt huge all of the time. Even after a few days, it just still feels big. This, after only a few hours, it doesn't shrink around you, but it's not, it's not intimidatingly large. Look, even when it comes to parking in tight spots, judging the parameters is actually pretty easy. In saying that, I'm fortunately a bit tall. If you're a bit shorter, it might be hard to see the parameters of the vehicle. But yeah, reverse parking this in a tight spot, not too bad. And obviously with a vehicle this size and this weight, it does pitch and roll a little bit. But again, it's, it's nothing bad, nothing to complain about too much. Now, as far as the suspension and ride and handling in this one goes, 
yeah, look, it's comfortable. Like, it's not it's not too bad. Initial bumps are a bit on the harsh side, but again, for what this vehicle is, it does the job. I tell you what, it is really nice not ever having to worry about potholes or like some of these crap roads. It just, it does actually beat them in a submission. Now, maybe part of the way it kind of hides its size is through the steering. The steering does feel very light, like, a kind of a bit vague light. Obviously, it's not trying to be a performance car by any means, but it can be sometimes, especially in tight situations, a little bit hard to judge where you're placing the vehicle. Um, and especially when you get up to a bit of speed, it does kind of wander around a little bit. Now, engine-wise, this is the V8, and it's just... Oh, first of all, sounds great. Sounds really, really good. But it's just such a beautiful power plant. It reminds me of like the viscosity of really thick liquid just kind of rolling out of a container, just kind of rolls this power through, and it's so, so, so nice. It's not fast, but it's bloody lovely to use. Also, just on the power, like there's plenty there to overtake and you know pull onto the freeway. It's again not fast, but it does the job. Now the brakes in this one, they're fine, they do the job. And the transmission, super smooth, no drummers there. But if you are test driving one of these, make sure you find like a loose surface and try all of the four-wheel drive functionality, especially in reverse as well. Make sure all of that stuff works. Now, aside from the wonderful engine sound, there are some other noises in here. There are quite a few rattles and you know creaks and stuff going on. But again, I'm gonna forgive it because it just, it just has character and charm. And I feel like the amount of kilometers on it and the age of it, I'm, I'm happy to look past a few rattles. They're not horrific. It doesn't sound like the thing's falling apart, but you can just tell some of the plastics are getting a bit brittle. Look, overall, I bloody love driving this thing. Like even in this scenario, in this situation, even like through kind of traffic and busyness of Sydney, it's just enjoyable. Look, yes, there are so many other vehicles that are far better suited to this kind of environment. In fact, in saying that, plenty of 100 series owners are probably better off buying like a Kluger or a Highlander instead of one of these. That would make way more sense. But there's just something about a Land Cruiser, isn't there? You know what it is? It's knowing that you can handle anything that's thrown in front of you. Like, just in case, like, if you're popping down to the shops, it's just nice knowing that if there were to be a zombie apocalypse at any moment, no dramas, this thing's got a cupboard. So when it comes to actually buying these, look, yes, there are examples out there on the used market for $10,000 and less. The thing is, they're most likely going to be the 4.5 litre petrols. They're going to have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kilometres on them. They're going to be in interesting condition. But unless you're buying one of these as purely a project vehicle, or you've got extremely deep pockets when it comes to paying for that fuel, because the fuel consumption is interesting, yeah, we'd be apprehensive. And look, yes, there are also examples out there for under $30,000. And there can be some okay ones in that bunch, but if you're after something that's basically turn up, buy it, get in, turn the key, and you're off adventuring somewhere, budget for sort of forty dollars to $50,000 for something pretty decent. And also, just back to that fuel consumption as well, we found a fantastic guide on 4x4fever.com, and what it's claiming pretty much matches up to what a lot of the owners were claiming as well. You want to hit pause to see what it is? Hit pause now. Okay, now when it comes to servicing, look, loads of these on the used market are going to be showing hundreds of thousands of kilometres, and they will generally do well over half a million kilometres as long as they've been, been maintained correctly. So if you are in the market, make sure that the seller has some kind of, you know, service history. Ideally, if it's got really, really high kilometres on it, like over 400,000, if they're doing oil changes every 5,000 k's, that's a bloody good thing. Now when it comes to parts and servicing, this is one of the big areas that these are so attractive because the support network is absolutely huge. Parts on these are everywhere and they're generally really affordable and pretty much everybody, every mechanic in Australia has worked on a 100 series so they should know what they're doing and it also won't cost you a fortune because they generally don't ask a premium. Now just back to the whole support thing, guys, we joined a whole bunch of owners groups doing the research for this and the vast majority of them are just awesome. The advice and help they gave was brilliant. Nathan, that lent us this vehicle, absolute bloody legend. However, there are a couple of cranky old bastards amongst that bunch. We've decided to ignore them because they're dickheads and so should you. Obviously, again, the vast majority of owners, legends, not those three. Okay, so what goes wrong with these things? And according to many in the owner's community, the first big issue is rust. Now, the major place is around the windscreen, especially at the top, and especially if the windscreen has been replaced incorrectly. Also, these gutters or these railings up here 
under this they can rust as well, especially if aftermarket roof racks have been fitted. Again, maybe not all that well. Uh, also, sometimes on the like the little there's like a little rubber grommet under some of these actual mounts. If that perishes, water can get in there as well. So take all this apart, check for rust under there, and yeah, around the windscreen. Also, there have been other issues with rust around like modifications that haven't been fitted correctly, or even worse, accident damage that has been repaired poorly. Actually, just on that whole accessories thing. Make sure, like most of these are going to be covered in some kind of accessory, make sure everything fitted is like good quality and has been fitted professionally. Now also on the whole accessory thing, you've got to remember like a bull bar, a winch, extra rear, rear tires, a steel rear bar, all that stuff, it all adds weight. Then when you add like a full family and all their luggage on board, you're very quickly hitting the GVM limits of the vehicle. And then if you go and add like a caravan or a camper to the back of it, you're very quickly exceeding that GVM limit. Now this might just be exclusive to New South Wales, but the authorities here are really cracking down on this stuff and throwing fines at these things that have exceeded their GVM limits like crazy. Worse still, if you happen to have an accident and your vehicle is past that GVM limit, it, what that does for your insurance could be disastrous. Oh, also, just on the whole rust thing, if water does get inside the vehicle, like any vehicle, water mixing with potentially electronics, that's never going to be a good thing. Also, the seal around the tail light, it can also perish and let water into the tailgate, which can eventually turn into corrosion and rust. But overall, for the exterior, that's about it, which considering the use these get and how old they are, that's awesome. Now look, inside, as these are becoming older, the plastics are becoming quite brittle and they can break, but plenty of owners complain about just a heap of different rattles and whatnot going on in here. In saying that, it's not trying to be a luxury car, so surely we can forgive it for a few rattles. Okay, next up, the handbrake assembly. It can be utter crap, total rubbish unless it's been set up absolutely perfectly. Now there's a seal in the AC evaporator behind the glove box and it can leak into the footwell, but the good news is it's pretty easily fixed. Well, also on the HVAC system, the heater core itself, it might need replacing too. Oh, like also there can be like the odd little electronic gremlin here and there, but for interior problems, that's about it. And again, for like the age of these vehicles and what, they're, what they get put through, that's super impressive. But now to the serious stuff, guys. Mechanically, what can go wrong with these? Well, look, I'm, I can't tell you because I'm not qualified to tell you I'm not a mechanic, but Jim is. When we talk about what goes wrong with these things, well, it depends. I mean, they're all pretty old now and a lot of them have very high mileage. They've all got different service histories and the way they've been used varies greatly too. Some have just been used to, you know, thrash through the bush to get to the great camping sites. Others have just been baby boomered from caravan park to caravan park. So yeah, it varies a lot. So I'm going to generalize here about what goes wrong and I'm not actually going to include too much of the things that just break due to, you know, extreme forward driving. Basically there's four engines across the board, two diesels, two petrols. First up, I'm going to start with a 1HZ six cylinder diesel. Typically really not much goes wrong. Uh, occasionally we see some oil leaks and the odd fuel leak from the fuel pump. But it's not uncommon for these things to get to 500,000 kilometres. Well serviced, that's pretty achievable. If you put a set of injectors in it every 200 and 250,000 k's, you can really expect these things to be very trouble free. However, just be careful of the ones that have had aftermarket turbo kits fitted to them. There's nothing wrong with that. If the kit's been installed properly and the tune is right and the tune is conservative, you could expect to get hundreds of thousands of kilometres out of it without any problems. But if you lean on it too hard, if you wind the fuel up, wind the boost up, yeah, it very much compromises the reliability. Now, the 1HD six-cylinder diesel, this is arguably one of the most reliable modern-day diesel engines out there. And if well-serviced, easily 500,000 k's, if not more in a lot of cases. Uh, sometimes we see some exhaust manifold studs break and occasionally we see some oil leaks, but overall, very reliable. Occasionally we do see some complicated fuel leak issues from the fuel pump, which can be exp expensive to repair. Uh, to mitigate the risk of that, I would strongly urge you to do your fuel filter at least every 20,000 k's, and that way it'll improve your chances of getting that high mileage. There are some examples out there that have had, you know, catastrophic bottom end failures. Look, typically that is at very high mileage and maybe the service history on those was questionable, but I would also argue that those failures are at at least 300,000 k's plus. And you know, even that's pretty amazing because a lot of engines don't even get anywhere near that. But if well serviced, it's extremely unlikely. Now the 1FZ six cylinder petrol, really solid engine, very reliable. Uh, occasionally we do see some oil consumption issues on the higher mileage ones. 
uh, oil leaks and the valve stem seals tend to leak on these things and you'll know that by if the car's sitting idling for a length of time and then you take off it'll let out a plume of blue smoke. It very rarely makes the vehicle stop or have any complications, it just gets a bit stinky and contributes to the oil consumption. Occasionally we see some head gasket issues but that's more so when the coolant has been left way too long be between changes and the head gasket just rots from the inside out. Not really a common problem though. And over the years we occasionally see an ignition coil or ignition lead complication but really that's more of a service and maintenance kind of problem, really not common though. Now the 2UZ V8 petrol, it is just a solid unit. Uh, it used to be complained about that that used too much fuel and it was too expensive to run but I would say that that was in the days where, well in Australia at least, where diesel was considerably cheaper than petrol. I would say these days that the 2UZ fuel economy really isn't a factor compared to the diesel engines, especially if you're towing a caravan or whatever. They're all going to cost you a fortune to run in fuel. The 2UZ is, yeah, as I said, a solid unit um, and you're very unlikely to see any catastrophic engine failures if it's been well serviced. Maybe the odd oil leak or maybe an ignition complication occasionally, but overall extremely reliable. Let's talk about the timing belts and water pumps. Now the 1FZ six cylinder petrol is the only one with a timing chain. All the rest of them have timing belts which are due at 150,000 Ks. And if you do that on time and do a water pump at the same time, you are extremely unlikely to have any problems. As for the rest of the car, well, the 100 series, the independent front suspension, does have a lot of moving, moving parts. Uh, occasionally we've seen the control arm crack where the torsion bar mounts. There are upgraded arms for that available and strengthening brackets, there's plenty of options there. With those, from the factory they all looked quite low in the front and a lot of people put bigger springs in the front just to level it out, it made it look way better. If you're going to do that, make sure you put a diff drop kit in at the same time and that just helps correct the angle of the drive shafts. If you don't, it'll probably operate okay but the first time you do any serious off-roading, you're going to have braking CV issues. So definitely get those drive shaft angles corrected. The 105s with the solid axle in the front. Look, a lot of people complain about the swivel housing seals leaking. It's not actually the swivel housing seals or the wiper seals. It's the axle seals internally of that. Diff oil leaks out of there, fills up those swivel bearing housings and leaks out the wiper seals. Really common problem, not difficult to fix, but typically when you do it, you'd repack the CVs and you'd also renew the swivel bearings at the same time. Honestly, once every five years or every couple of hundred thousand Ks is plenty for that. Similar story with the rear diff actually, the solid axle there, often the axle seals fail and it just pisses oil out all over the rear brakes. It can get very messy. Uh, if you're having chronic issues with those leaking, Pro tip, check the diff breather points. Uh, if they're blocked in any way, that would just pressurize the whole rear diff when it warms up and just make the oil spew out. So yeah, check the breathers. With the 105s, when you do some serious off-roading, occasionally you'll see cracks in things like panhard rod mounts, control arm mounts, and around the uh, steering box as well. So just keep a good eye on that. Occasionally we see some heater core leaks and the blend motors or the flaps, or we like to call them flapuators. If they fail, you've got to pull the whole dash out of the thing just to repair it, so that can be expensive. Some people just put up with it, but yeah bit of a pain. Another complication we see is with the brake master cylinder. That's the ABS control module. It is prone to failure and if you want to get a new one at Toyota, well it's a three to four thousand dollar repair. Pro tip, it can actually be repaired. You can pull it apart in some cases and the motor can be repaired and it can save you thousands. But yeah, just be very careful before you spend three or four grand on a new one. The automatic transmissions in these, both the four and five speeds, are pretty tough and good for all around everything. Uh, if you are towing though, you really should service it at least every 50,000 Ks. Oh, and make sure you've got a good quality oil cooler on it too. Now as for the manuals, the 5 speed manuals, the 1HZ and the 1FZ versions, they had the R series transmission. Now there are some reports that they're not great for towing, but there are a bunch of upgrade kits you can do to those things just to make them just better all round. Now the 1HD and the V8 petrols, they had the H spec gearbox, again 5 speed. It is considered to be much stronger than the other ones, typically no problems. Although sometimes you see the selector bush or seal that sits at the base of the selector, when that just rots and falls apart it becomes difficult to get gears. It's a pretty easy fix, less than 100 bucks to do it. Now if you're looking at buying one, just be super aware of shitty mods and especially electrically. A lot of these have got second batteries put in and a whole bunch of extra electrical stuff. And for those of you playing at home, can we please stop putting wiring through bulkheads and firewalls without a effing grommet? It's just 
piecework really and it can eventually cause huge electrical problems including fires so just take the time run a grommet and do it properly another thing to look out for is bad tunes more so on the diesels you can make a lot of power out of these and they can be great for towing with some nice tasteful mods but here's a tip if it's pumping out black smoke it might be making good power but it's not a good tune and ultimately all that black smoke it's probably going to be the cause of its inevitable failure and the same can be said for the rest of the modifications. A lot of these are heavily modified. You just have to look at those modifications and just make sure they've been done right. Have they been bolted on properly? Are they good quality bits and pieces? You really got to look at that stuff carefully because it's most likely it's going to be the mods that give you a pain in the ass on these things. So double check all of it. Now, on top of all of that, as I said earlier, a massive thank you to all of the owners groups. And if you do want to do more research on these, they should be the first port of call. But as well as that, there are a few videos that you really need to go and watch if you're interested in these. So, 4x Overland, he has a whole series on the 105 and it is excellent. Full drive 24-7, they have loads of 100 and 105 series videos and they're all full of great information. There's a channel called Chow Cares. Read through the comments in his videos too. Also, we've made like the ultimate 4x4 buyer's guide. Make sure you watch that before you buy, not just a 100 series, but really any four-wheel drive because it could save you a fortune. All the links for those videos are down there in the description and if you are going to buy one of these they are a must watch but should you buy one of these at all yes 100% yes you should if you've made it this far in the video we'd like to think that now you know what you're getting yourself into and if you're happy to sign up to all that is this generation of Land Cruiser and you've done your due diligence and found the right example well you might just be buying one of the greatest four-wheel drives ever produced but which specific one of these should you buy well that's going to come down to you and your needs and about a thousand other variables. If you're touring and don't require like the most hardcore off-roading chops, well, obviously get a 100 over a 105. But do you get a petrol or a diesel? Well, the V8 petrol is powerful and it sounds great, but it can be bloody thirsty. The diesel, however, is arguably the best diesel engine Toyota have ever produced. Reliable, economical, and has potential to make way more power. And with good maintenance, will do north of 700,000 kilometers easily. But if you're into rock crawling up some godforsaken trail relatively close to home, well, get a 105. But again, petrol or diesel? Well, the petrols are thirsty, but they offer decent power even when stock, but they can be turbocharged to make serious power if that's your thing. And the petrol 105s are generally the most affordable of this entire family. And many in the community argue that the difference in the purchase price and even the maintenance more than makes up for the extra fuel consumption. But the diesel can be an extremely reliable engine capable of doing well over half a million kilometers. However, they are pretty slow and they can be modified to fix this. However, if they're not modified and tuned properly, well, reliability can take a hit. Basically guys, really only you can decide which one of these is best for you. Just find the best one you can, hopefully with a really thorough service history. Please, please go and get a pre-purchase inspection done, preferably by a 4x4 specialist. And if it ticks all of the boxes, yeah, go and buy it. Now all of this brings us to the big question, which one do you buy? Or do you buy an 80 series, or maybe a 200 series, or maybe a Patrol, or maybe a Land Rover? Let us know in the comments below. See you next time. You know, I'm, um, I'm genuinely, sniff, 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 genuinely. Also, there has been other, oh, Jesus, okay. Crack panard rod mounts and things like that, and occasionally, occasionally, I'll do that again. The autos, the 4 and 5 speed, they are tough. Um, I did that thing again. <laughs> It's the Subaru buffering thing. With the most solid service history that you can possibly... No, sorry again. My brain literally stopped. Okay, here we go.